Uh, but today, we have Professor Mary Wood coming to speak to you all. Uh, professor Wood is uh, a law professor at the University of Oregon, and she is the faculty director and founder of the Natural Resources Law Program there. And uh, as the faculty director of that program, she actually has an enormous number of things she's doing. It's not just a, a title, and I have a list of them, just some of them. But yeah, I, I'm not going to list all of them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list four. So in her role there, she runs the Conservation Trust Project, the Sustainable Land Use Project, the Native Environmental Sovereignty Project, and the Food Resilience Project. That's one person doing four distinct and really uh, important things, it sounds like. So we're very lucky to have Professor Wood with us. We're also lucky to have her because she is, and I'm learning this more as we've talked a little bit through the day, but she is a true uh, Westerner. And I imagine for somebody as, with as deep roots in the West as, as Professor Wood, it's not easy to get her out, to come out here, and to convince her to come out here. She was born in Oregon. She went to a college at the University of Washington, law school at Stanford, um, then worked for the Ninth Circuit, which for those who aren't lawyers or law students is a Western uh, appellate court, and then worked in a private practice in, in, Washi in uh, Washington and Oregon, and then worked for the government, in uh, the federal government in Portland, and uh, now teaches, of course, at the University of Oregon. So you've, you've uh, had to sort of shake that off for a little bit to come out here, and we appreciate that. Um, and Professor Wood is here tonight to talk about her new book, Nature's Trust, which is a really interesting book, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but I want to say that the, the premise of the book is essentially that environmental law isn't working. And what Professor Wood's here to propose is a, uh, a new way of looking at environmental law and a new paradigm for dealing with the significant environmental problems that we all know about. But I won't talk any more about that. I will let her do it. So uh, Professor Wood, thank you very much for coming. Oh, thank you so much, Josh, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming tonight. I realize your time is very, very valuable and it's just an honor to be here and, and thank you so much for organizing this, Josh and Suzanne and environmental students. It's been a real pleasure. And the real, the real issue with getting me out here is the carbon emissions because I'm a bike commuter and so I try not to um, fly at all, but this was worth it and um, I'm just delighted. So my talk um, starts with the premise that we're really in a new ecological age. And many of us live the same way we lived 10 years ago. Um, and we haven't really awakened to the fact that we are in a, a truly a new ecological age that we, that we don't really talk about out there. But I'm going to talk about it in here. Um, rather than spend the whole hour, which I could, on the indicators, I'm just going to just mention three things. Um, conservation biologists say that we've started the world's six, the planet's sixth extinction. The oceans, uh, it is said, are dying. We may not have wild seafood in a few decades. That's a food source that people have relied on since time immemorial. And climate crisis is coming with such speed and urgency that it's really blowing apart many, many models. Um, this week, the UN's IPCC, the climate group, issued its last report saying that climate crisis was severe, pervasive, and irreversible in some cases. Secretary Kerry just responded by saying, unless we act dramatically and quickly, scientists tells us, science tells us our climate and our way of life are literally in jeopardy. And he says, quote, the costs of inaction are catastrophic. And so if we were rational people, I think we would view this as a wartime mobilization. We would all be talking about it. We'd all be doing things differently. All of our, it would be the subject of all our daily conversations. And yet, we are not. And I think that the reason we are not talking about it or dealing with it is because we're all relying on our environmental laws to deal with it. We've got this huge environmental law structure out there. It's the structure I've taught for 20 years. And we assume it's working. Um, it is the most elaborate law system, environmental law system, in the entire world. We have more regulations than any living human being could possibly ever digest. Um, but I wrote my book because I felt that there were patterns across environmental law at the federal, state, and local levels, so I mean land use law as well, and natural resources law, I mean the whole gamut, um, showing that environmental law is failing. And if it were, um, if, if we did not sit in a situation where our very life systems are at risk, and that equates to survival for young people later in the century, then I think I'd take my time in, in speaking out and writing this book, 
But the fact is, there is urgency that we've never even dealt with before. So <coughs> other disciplines are organizing differently. They're innovating. Um, we see innovations in planning, um, in even economics. Some people are questioning the whole basis of capitalism. We see innovations all around, but we don't see innovations in the legal system. For the most part, most people are still relying on the same statutes that have delivered, I think, this crisis to our doorstep. So I wanted to bring a different frame to you tonight. I call it the Nature's Trust Frame. It's based on the public trust principle, which has been a principle in our law long before our statutes ever came about. It's the oldest principle in environmental law. It has roots dating back to actually Roman law. And it looks at our uh, environment out there, not as something just subject to regulation, um, but as a trust. And a trust is a property concept that's managed by one party for the benefit of another party. And so all the sky, you know, the, the atmosphere, the forest, the trees, all that, the rivers and the wildlife, um, in this nature's trust frame or this public trust frame, we look at that as wealth that's supposed to endure from generation to generation. But more than that, we look at it as a trust that holds our life systems together. If you are thinking about your college account or your retirement account, those are just minimal compared to the importance of this trust. Because without it, life does not persist. And unfortunately, that's what the scientists are telling us, that if we blow through the climate tipping points, we cannot support the life systems on Earth. Um, Gus Speth, who was the dean of uh, the Yale School of Forestry up until just a few years ago, wrote this marvelous book called Bridge at the Edge of the World. And he said, if we continue business as usual, life, the planet, in the second part of the century, which begins around 2050, won't be fit to live in. And so that's just 36 years from now. So we have to wake up and do things a bit differently. Albert Einstein said, you know, the definition of insanity is doing things the same way over and over again and expecting a different result. Um, our statutory law, which I'll go into momentarily, I think has developed into just a broad permitting system where it permits damage. I'd like to first talk about the public trust and the rights that it's based in. Then I'll talk just briefly about the dysfunction of statutory law and really what I think is wrong with it and why it's causing so much damage. And then we'll return to the trust for some more specific details. How many of you are in the law school? Just a few of you. Okay, well this is a general book and for general audience. We'll start with the trust. Um, this public trust principle has been around since the beginning of the country and it accesses principles of individual rights that go back to the constitutional expectations underlying our whole government. Um, the loss of our environment, I think, is, loss, is symptomatic, if you will, of the loss of our democracy as a whole. If I had given this talk four months ago, I would have started in the same place I am now, which is really talking about individual constitutional rights to an environment. But now I have the benefit of the, a very extensive judicial opinion from the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, um, issued in December of 2013. The Chief Justice of that Supreme Court wrote an opinion exceeding 100 pages on the public trust doctrine. He created, if you will, um, a whole integrated, cohesive environmental jurisprudence for other courts to follow. So this isn't some theory anymore. Um, I tried to do the same thing in my book, but my point today is this isn't some theory that you might come across. This is ready now to be implemented and pulled off the shelf in other states as well. In that case, which is called the Robinson case, um, the Supreme Court overturned a statute passed by the Pennsylvania legislature which would have pushed fracking through uh, the local communities in Pennsylvania. They found that that statute violated the public trust doctrine. Now that was a plurality opinion um, and so it was not a majority of the court but they were joined by another justice who found basically um, that the, uh, the statute was unconstitutional on due process grounds. So this remains um, the most comprehensive judicial template for the public trust. Um, <clears throat> Justice Castile, who was the Chief Justice, began his opinion by saying that there are certain environmental rights that we all hold, and this was his language, they are inherent and indefeasible rights, and that is an essential ecology. He said, 
They are of such great and essential quality as to be ensconced as inviolate. Has anybody told you that before? I mean, <laughs> really, this is exciting. You've probably heard you have the right to comment under NEPA, but have you ever been told that we all hold these inviolate rights that are ensconced in the Constitution? It's, it's pretty remarkable. Now, that Pennsylvania Constitution has a special trust provision, but if you read the opinion carefully, this, doesn't, um, this, this language doesn't depend on that specific constitutional provision in Pennsylvania's Constitution. It can apply to all states, I think, because in all cases, the social contract with government reserves rights to the people. Um, Justice Castile also said, certain rights are inherent to mankind and thus are secured rather than bestowed by the Constitution. So he's basically saying these always existed. He also said that these are on par with political rights. We think of our rights to due process and equal protection. But this justice, if you read the opinion carefully, was pretty much out to set forth an environmental jurisprudence, constitutional jurisprudence, on par, I think, with our political constitutional jurisprudence. Well, when you have a right, you have a duty on the part of government to fulfill that right. And so that's where we come um, to the trust. The trust is the construct that fulfills these inherent rights that we all have. And the reason we have these rights is because the founder, the founding fathers, so to speak, realized that, that we, the people, would rely on nature and some resources had to be retained for us and future generations. They couldn't just be privatized and used um, for private exploit. And so the construct to protect these rights was the public trust. Well, the public trust says, and it's a doctrine present in every single state in the country, and there's federal cases saying it applies to the federal government as well, although the Department of Justice adamantly um, argues about that. Nevertheless, <coughs> the trust um, opinions out there say that the government is a trustee, so states, or in those cases, the federal government. The um, wealth is the natural resources that are crucial to our survival, so stream beds, water, wildlife, um, and now I think air and others. And the um, beneficiaries are those of us in the present generation and also the future generations. So there's this dual quality to the trust. It's both inter, intragenerational, meaning all of us alive today have equality of right and these resources can't just be privatized and exploited to our detriment. But it's also got an intergenerational focus, meaning that it's a trust account that's supposed to endure through the generations. So if you're looking for environmental justice principles, I think they can be lodged here. If you're looking for principles for, to protect future generations, they're right here in, in the decisions that have already been rendered. Um, one of the key cases, in fact, the landmark case um, establishing this in the Supreme Court of the United States was Illinois Central. How many of you have heard of that case before? A few? Okay. And that's where the Supreme Court of the United States encountered the situation I'd never before seen the, um, the Illinois legislature had uh, privatized, given away to a railroad, private railroad corporation, the Chicago shoreline. And this was shoreline that the citizens needed for their you know, activities like fishing, commerce, all the things they needed for their daily lives. And it was just given away by the legislature. Um, kind of like what is happening today, I think, with our fossil fuels. Um, we need certain resources water, groundwater, and the legislatures are allowing fracking and so forth, even though they're um, going to harm these resources we need. Well, it was challenged um, in this case, and the Supreme Court of the United States said, no, the legislature didn't have the power to privatize the Chicago shoreline. It was held in trust because it was a crucial resource that the people would rely on, not only in that generation, but for future generations. So it literally said, the legislature is a sovereign that's restricted by the public trust. It literally doesn't have the power. The, the people kept back property rights in this resource. And so all of those of us in this room hold public property rights. We may not have private property. Some of us do, some of us don't. But we all hold these public property rights that interface with the private ones. And there's a limit on how much can be privatized or given away. Um, so, with that, that's just an introduction to the trust. Let's briefly turn to statutory law and figure out you know, why has that failed uh, so much. Well, statutory law, how many of you have dealt with statutes or regulations 
<laughs> okay, well maybe this will resonate with you. I like to show a slide of gopher holes when I talk about statutory law because um, in the 1970s, Congress passed a multitude of statutes, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, all those, you know, over a dozen in all major ones. And then the states <coughs> passed equivalents. And so we've got more statutory law than we can ever even fathom, really. Um, and when you, and it's what we teach in, in the law school, and when you go into a field uh, like Clean Water Act regulation or any regulatory program, you kind of drop down into a big gopher hole. <laughs> And um, some people never come out of that hole because all they see is that statute and the almost Byzantine processes that have been built around those statutory programs. The whole part of nature has been partitioned into these micro approaches to environmental health. And the point is that these statutes have become the reality for, for, for all governmental agents really working in the various bureaucracies. And so when they're when they're down in there, that is what they see. Well, <clears throat> in the beginning, um, it was thought that these agencies that implement the laws would be objective and neutral and, and represent the public and carry out the purposes of the statutes. But in fact, um, over time, over the course of 40 years, they become almost captive um, by industry, very politicized. And this has been the product um, of years and years, decades and decades of anti-regulatory campaigns mounted by industries. And I'm not going to go into the dynamics a whole lot because my experience with agency people is that they know this is the problem. They know that they've got so much pressure within the agencies to issue permits because they're worried, frankly, permit writers in many cases are worried about being fired if they don't issue a permit for a particular proposal that has, you know, big money behind it. So I'm not going to go into the dynamics so much, but I spent about 100 pages unraveling this in my book. And there's many, many books now on the politicization of agencies. The bottom line is that when you have campaign financing working into a system and, and um, basically buying the legislatures, and then when you have campaign financing um, going into the campaigns of governors and the president, you open up a situation where the agency tools will be used as payback for that campaign financing and permits will be granted to the big developers who donated to the campaigns or the big fossil fuel companies and so forth. Um, and so suffice it to say that the agencies are politicized and they're issuing so many permits now, there's not really a that's enough point. There's no, you know, there's no statute that says that's enough. And if you look at the various programs that have been studied, um, they have about 99% approval rate for permits. That's the Corps of Engineers, um, the Endangered Species Act has that, and so, and state programs, many as well. And so this is a real problem because if you look at what our environmental law has done, it was supposed to protect resources, but it's turned into a legalization of damage. It's turned into just legalized damage, which is a very dangerous situation. Agency people will often come to me and say, well, you know, it's not really that black and white, and it's not. Um, perhaps, they say there's conditions put on permits so the damage is less than it otherwise would be, which is definitely true in many cases. The problem is that's only consolation until you reach the end point. And we're staring at that right now. In other words, the cumulative damage mounts up. Maybe it was slower than it otherwise would have been, but it's, we're now sort of at that end of the road and we have to switch tracks. I wrote in my book that Environmental law is the cane upon which humanity leans as it walks the plank to its own destruction. <laughs> um, so I'll leave that thought um, uh, with you on, on, on what we're facing. Now, why is this happening? Well, it's really a failure of democracy. Our democracy assumed a check on agencies. And um, if you say nothing else to yourself when you wake up in the morning, remind yourself that we just have three branches of government. That's a great place to start. We have the legislature, the courts, and the agencies. That's it, we don't have any more. And so the agencies are who we've talked about, and they're filled with very, very good people, uh, just heroes in many cases, but they've got this pressure. The legislatures, well, you know about them. I mean, I don't even have to, I just have to say the name Congress, and you can sort of carry that thought forward. They're not going to correct this situation. And that leaves the courts. The courts, 
have been very passive because these judges have assumed um, that the premise underlying our administrative law still maintains, that the agencies are these objective players. So the courts have kind of pulled back. They give a lot of deference to the agency's technical conclusions. And so the most politicized conclusions are those ones that are hidden behind a mask of science, and those are the ones the judges give the most deference to. And so, by and large, um, there has not been an active judiciary. So we don't really have an environmental democracy. What we have is um, power consolidated in, remember we just have three branches of government. So <laughs> we have power consolidated in one branch, which is very dangerous because that one branch holds the key to our survival and our prosperity and our well-being. I don't care how important the Department of Labor is, or the FBI, or anybody else, the real important players are the environmental agencies because they hold control over the life systems supporting our health, livelihood, and uh, all, all aspects really of our, our being. So <clears throat> with the failure of environmental law, the law is quickly being drained of its legitimacy, even in the public. Many of you know of the Keystone Pipeline, I'm sure, and you know that um, this is a, a huge project with impacts that, according to Dr. James Hansen, could, could be uh, game over for the climate. That was a quote of his. And yet we have an environmental impact statement that found no significant, environmental, <laughs> no significant environmental impact from that pipeline. Well, people in the common public are recognizing that the environmental law isn't working. There's now 94,000 people signed up to be arrested if the Keystone Pipeline is approved. And you see these growing demonstrations um, all around the country. So um, that puts pressure on the system to change. So now let's switch. We've talked about the fundamental basis of the trust. We've talked about the failure of statutory law. Now let's talk about how, how the law could be reframed along public trust grounds. And again, I'm not talking about some theory that, that hasn't materialized. I'm talking about something on the shelf, ready to pull out and used in virtually any environmental problem you can think of. It's, it could be applicable to um, dead zones in the ocean, to the climate crisis, um, to maybe the favorite squirrel you might want to save if it's an endangered species, to, to the Wallow Mountains in Oregon. It can be used in all these situations because it, it dives to a deeper level than statutory law. Statutes, if you, how many of you scuba dive? Nobody? One per, a couple? Well, I don't, <laughs> but I do know this. You go to different depths. So the public trust takes you down to this deeper place in the law. It's a constitutional place, whereas the statutes are way up there on the surface. So statutes only apply to what they apply to, but the public trust harnesses these fundamental principles of our, our relationship with our government and can apply to all these situations. Um, what is this relationship to the statutory law? Well, it's really pretty simple. If, if, a, if a statute violates the public trust, um, it logically could be overturned by a public trust um, doctrine if that doctrine were constitutional. And we've got many people saying it is. So it can be used against legislative action, potentially, and also against agency action. Um, here is the structure. The government is the trustee. The beneficiaries are present and future generations of citizens. The trust asset would be the, um, the rest of the trust. We call it the rest in law. Would be all those resources crucial to our survival and well-being. Now, the old cases started with the stream beds. But let me ask you one question. Can you imagine a case where, where atmosphere might be crucial to your survival? <laughs> Is there any reason not to apply the same principle that was applied to stream beds to, say, the air we breathe or the atmosphere? Um, groundwater, drinking water sources, beaches, these have all been um, decided to be within the scope of the public trust doctrine. And the Robinson opinion that I just mentioned said it basically applies to all resources that the public has an interest in. So if that's the, the property um, and the government is trustee, the, the public trust announces fiduciary obligations towards this trustee. So all of a sudden when you look at your agency officials, if you look at say the Social Security Department or the FBI or the Department of Education on the federal or state level, 
you're fine looking at them as, say, bureaucrats, even though they don't perhaps like that term. They're just standard officials. But when you interact with officials that have control over the wetlands and the fish and wildlife and the forests and such, those are trustees. They're not just the ordinary government officials. They are sitting in positions where the public trust binds their actions. And their actions have to meet, according to the courts, fiduciary obligations, whereas the others don't have that. So fiduciary obligations are what keeps a trust a trust rather than a tyranny. Um, if I, let's take another example. Let's say um, that you had a, a college account and I was your trustee. And it was a million dollars, well funded. Um, if I was your trustee and you were the beneficiary of the college account, could I squirrel a little bit of the money for a trip to Hawaii? And it's a big knot with a capital N. <laughs> so it's a big N-O. In other words, the fiduciary obligations say that the trust must be managed only for the beneficiary, not for the benefit of government. What I just told you about the politicization of the statutory regime, the statutes are allowing government to, to manage our resources for their political benefit as payoffs for campaign contributions and the like. So when courts enter the room of the public trust, they have to apply a list of very strict fiduciary obligations. What are those and how are they different? Um, well, let's go through them. The first one um, says that you can't allow substantial impairment of the asset. You have to protect the asset. Well, we've blown way beyond substantial impairment to the atmosphere. It is substantially impaired. But a court would say, no, you have to, um, a court enforcing the trust would say, you have to protect these assets against substantial impairment. And they also say, and the Robinson Court said this very eloquently recently, that this is an act of duty. A lot of problems we have with government is just not stepping up to the threats like climate crisis. And this, this trust doctrine says, no, trustees can't sit idle. This is an act of duty, and they can't just be passive. So it's a big, big difference from statutory law. Second is they have to maximize the value of the natural assets to the public. In other words, um, let me tell you about how statutory law works right now. If you apply for a permit under the Clean Water Act, say, say you're applying for a permit to pollute for a bubble gum machine, and you're applying for a permit to pollute for a kidney dialysis machine, a life-saving machine, you'd have equal standing under the Clean Water Act. There's no duty to maximize the benefit to the public from this activity. In the trust, there is. And so each trust inquiry has to go through, is this going to maximize the benefit? It gets better than that for the public. There's also a rule announced by both the Robinson Court and the Hawaii Supreme Court saying you not only have to maximize the benefit, you can't issue permits um, if the primary purpose is to benefit a private party. So um, there can be some private benefit, but you can't issue a permit for the primary purpose of benefiting a private party. Well, in the Pacific Northwest, all we're hearing about now is, is Jobs, 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 issue permits for this and that for the reason of jobs. That's completely, flatly contrary to this principle I just announced under the public trust. Um, now, not all courts have gone into this. Many have just announced the trust and not explored these fiduciary obligations, but some courts have, and I tried to compile those in my book. Um, another one is you can't administer the trust for the, a benefit of one segment of society over another. And this was really, this kind of like the principle I just said, but it's a little bit different because it talks about segments of society. And so the Robinson Court, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, for example, you know, it had 100 pages on all this, so of course I'm mentioning it a lot. It said, basically, you can't, you can't allow the fracking industry to use up these resources because that benefits one segment of the population and prefers it over the citizens of Pennsylvania. So it's not just the private interest, it's taking the population as a whole and saying, you know, you can't work environmental injustice. So if you're looking for an environmental justice principle, it may be lodged in the public trust. Um, what about if, if rights are granted in violation of these duties? Well, the public trust is so strong. Remember, it's a doctrine of property law. So many cases have said, if, if a right is granted, you know, without without looking at the public interest and substantially impairing the resource, that the government has a duty to revoke the permits. 
without suffering the takings under private property law. In other words, the person never got the rights to begin with because this was held in trust. If it was put out of trust in violation of a fiduciary obligation, no, no private rights really accrued from that. That's an amazing concept. Also, courts have also held at least two or three Supreme Courts of states have said, this is a duty of continuing supervision. If you, for example, um, if uh, a state water agency doles out a bunch of permits to water rights holders, and then the situation changes where the public wouldn't be benefited by those permits, the, the government agency has to go in and, and continually supervise them and revoke them if necessary and reallocate them. So it's very, very strong. How do you enforce this? Well, the enforcement would come to the courts and does come to the courts. And um, my main point here, which we won't linger on very long, but um, you need to look at the resource as a whole. And so this enforcement often envisions a macro remedy. So say you have, uh, well, I'll talk about a remedy in the atmosphere, our climate system. That's where we're going to finish up this talk momentarily. Um, but say you have a, a fishery. Well, under environmental law, if you look at the Columbia River salmon, um, I'm pointing to him because he's from the Willamette Mountains of Oregon. If you have Columbia River salmon, they are impacted by, you know, 12 federal laws and many, many state laws. And so if you want to sue to protect the salmon, you have to go through each one of those laws. And each remedy might be very, very micro, might be just um, doing another EIS or doing another biological opinion or something of that nature. Very micro, it doesn't really solve the problem. A public trust remedy looks at the asset as a whole, and the court should um, apply these principles and say, for that asset as a whole, protect that fishery against substantial impairment. The fishery as a whole, do what you need to do to protect it. Um, okay, so we've come to the last part of my comments, and then I'll open up for questions. And that is um, maybe the most exciting part, which is climate. This is a climate speaker series. Um, so years ago, after Hurricane Katrina struck, first thing I thought of with Hurricane Katrina was um, the statutes aren't going to solve our climate crisis. They haven't yet. They've pretty much brought the climate crisis on us, and they won't work, and neither will international treaty negotiations. And the many years since Hurricane Katrina, I think, have borne that out. That I don't think they'll work in time. And so I started working on a public trust approach to climate and the atmosphere, and I thought, well, in some ways, this is kind of the easiest case. Um, because climate's going to threaten everybody, not just their amenities, but their very survival in the future. And I thought, the atmosphere is at least, you know, even though it's international, it's shared, it's at least one integral asset. You know, you know where it ends, and you know everybody is affected. So it's not like determining the boundaries of watershed or a fishery or something like that. And so I took the public trust doctrine and I tried to apply it to the atmosphere in a very simple way. Um, and in that way, it turned out into a, a huge uh, legal campaign that's called atmospheric trust litigation. So before I, I tell you about that in the end, let me just tell you the, the construct. So the atmosphere is one integral public trust asset. So you have the rest. Who are the trustees? Who do you think the trustees would be? People or governments? Nope, they're the beneficiaries. No, no, the trustees, okay, who are the trustees? Government, government who? Which governments? All the governments. All the governments. So they're co-trustees. So we, we often have co-trustees of, of bank accounts and so forth. So each state and each national government would be a co-trustee of the atmosphere. Each would then have a fiduciary obligation to prevent substantial impairment. Remember the substantial impairment? So <clears throat> Dr. James Hansen, pursuant to my request, He's, the, he's one of the foremost climate scientists in the world. He was former director of NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies. He developed a prescription, well, he assembled an international team and developed a prescription for the climate to return the atmosphere to equilibrium. Right now we have this very dangerous energy imbalance and we have to cut our carbon emissions to restore atmospheric equilibrium. And we can do that, but we have to cut our carbon emissions and we have to know by how much. And so he developed a prescription for the planet, for the um, planet's atmosphere. And it involves cutting carbon emissions by 6% a year. So if you forget everything else, just take that number with you and wake up every morning with it. Think, this year we have to cut 6%, next year we have to cut 
This is the fiduciary obligation incumbent, as a baseline at least, incumbent on all governments to protect the functioning of the atmosphere. In other words, without that, we, we risk heavily going over those tipping points and not being able to have a habitable planet. Now, how do you take that 6% and, and impose it on governments? Well, the public trust makes it rather streamlined. If it's a fiduciary obligation incumbent on the, the planet, the governments as a whole, it's, it's incumbent on every single government. And, and arguably more for the United States than anyone because we're the worst historic polluters. <coughs> and so the remedy in atmospheric trust litigation is simply asking courts to enforce, to, to force the government um, to do a climate recovery plan where they show how to reduce 6% a year and then carry through with it. Now this remedy is not a statutory remedy, it's nowhere in the statutes. But it's really not that dramatic if you look at other institutional litigation. If you look at busing litigation, treaty rights litigation, some land use litigation, uh, and prison litigation, courts will look at broad institutional failure and they'll create a remedy that fits. And so this doesn't ask the courts to actually go into the legislatures and say, you do this, 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 and this. That's the trustee's job, to figure out how to accomplish this protection. But the courts would order the legislatures to do a plan and then to come back to court saying they were carrying out their plan. So it keeps the courts within their judicial, traditional prerogative but it still uses the court system to force action, whereas right now the problem we have is the Obama administration and state legislatures are basically doing nothing in comparison to the scale we need in terms of action. So in 2011, um, a group formed, and I'm not a part of that group, um, but it's called Our Children's Trust, and it's formed, um, it was formed to carry this out on a global scale because international treaty negotiations had failed. So the idea is if you get the domestic um, legal obligation in place, these international obligations will come into force as well. And so I'll finish by telling you just um, a short update about that and then open it up for comments and questions. In 2011, um, cases and petitions, administrative petitions and, and some lawsuits, were filed to cover every single state in this entire country, 50 in all, all filed in the same week. It was remarkable. And one was filed against the Obama administration, suing President Obama and his agencies for failing to act on climate. So <clears throat> there were also suits launched in other countries as well, and more are launching um, in the very near future. They're preparing more. Hundreds, at this point, hundreds of lawyers are working pro bono on this campaign. It was launched in favor of, or, um, to represent plaintiffs that were youth. And so the, the youth plaintiffs are before the courts um, asserting their atmospheric trust right um, to a, an atmosphere that will be habitable. It's unprecedented. We've never seen a launch of litigation all saying the same thing, asking for the same remedy um, in the same week. And now these cases are on appeal because the lowest courts Basically, and these were the, you know, the lowest of the state courts got these cases. <laughs> and they'd never seen anything like this, really. Um, this is not like some, you know, criminal dispute or family law dispute. The, these judges basically have the planet on their docket. And the lowest judges of the lowest state courts pretty much said, I don't want to deal with this. And they said, it's, it's not my job. This is up to the legislature. Well, of course it's up to the legislature. That's the whole point of this litigation is that the legislatures are the trustees. They should act. They can't sit idle in face of this threat that they're not acting. So those cases went up to appeal, and they're now on appeal. Um, there's one in the state of Oregon before the Oregon Court of Appeals. There's one before the Alaska Supreme Court. Um, there's uh, maybe the most exciting one is an appeal before the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. And that hearing will be heard um, on May 2nd. If you're in the D.C. area or know anybody in the D.C. area, Encourage them to go to that hearing. It is a historic case. Again, it's out of the league of anything any judge has ever seen before because it's really never been the case that our planet's life systems have been in jeopardy as they are now. Um, and so <coughs> government says, the Department of Justice says, well, this isn't a matter for the courts, it's a matter for the legislature. 
and I've already addressed that. Um, but the takeaway point is this, and I'll end with this. If you were to, to look at climate and read all the climate science that I do, um, I think this is a pretty apt description of where we're at. It's as if we've jumped out of an airplane 20,000 feet high, and we, we have a parachute on, a good parachute, but we can't find the cords to pull it out. My husband was a smoke jumper for 20 years, and so that's a, a pretty, pretty scary thing when you can't find the cord. And the legal system holds a few cords. It doesn't hold all the cords. Every discipline needs to become engaged, and everybody needs to find their own cord to pull in this crisis. And, and the scientists say, we can still get ourselves out of this and have a habitable planet, but we have to act now, and we have to find those cores. And so years from now, I think people will look back, especially young people, people of you know, some ages in this room represented, I think people will look back and say, why did it take so long for the legal system to respond to this? Right now, the law is irrelevant. In, in face of the, the, the most major crisis humanity has ever faced, the law has proven itself irrelevant. It has not accomplished anything close to what needs to be accomplished. This is at least one strategy lined up and teed up. There's no other legal strategies like it, taking a macro approach to the problem, but this is one strategy. And I think years from now, if a court, maybe the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, maybe the Oregon uh, Court of Appeals, um, finds, yeah, there's an atmospheric trust obligation, I think generations will look back and say, well, that was obvious. This was the worst threat facing humanity. Um, people's ultimate life, liberty, and property is on the line. And the courts are asking the legislature to develop a plan to keep people safe. In the future, that was pretty obvious. Uh, I don't think it'll be one of those um, opinions that shocks the world several decades from now. What will shock the world would be, why did it take so long? So um, I think I will end with that and invite some questions. I hope, um, just to summarize, I've, I've talked a little bit about the failure of statutory law and, and a new trust paradigm. Um, that cannot displace the statutes, perhaps, but add more obligation in them. And um, I invite questions now. We have a few minutes. Thank you. And I'm going to give you the mic to ask questions. Oh, yeah? Okay. So that we can get you Okay. Oh, yeah. Good idea. So my question is, if this new trust paradigm gains traction, how you would see that playing out at the agency level because I guess to me whether it's statutory or whether it's trust based the agencies already have mandates to in essence hold resources in trust and do what is you know for the best good for the longest period of time so if they're not doing that now how do you foresee this trust paradigm changing that okay it's a great question so a couple of points um, as a legal matter, it certainly provides the basis for agencies to protect resources. It's a basis that many people didn't think they had. In other words, many agency people just look at the statutes and don't know about the trust and don't know that that could be a source of protective power, in essence. And so maybe some people within the agencies will take that and move forward with it, especially realizing the, the circumstances we sit in right now. But the other truth is that the political grip on agencies may still be as strong as it is now and may defeat even a trust approach, in which case you need to rely on something to release that grip. And it tends to be an industry or private interest grip on the agencies. Um, there's really only two things in our democracy which tend to release that kind of grip. And one is the courts, um, and one is civil disobedience. And so it's, it's really no wonder that we see nearly 100,000 people signing up to be arrested if the Keystone Pipeline is approved. There's, there's civil disobedience popping up all around the country now. And that kind of pressure has often in the past dislodged um, agency, um, you know, agency biases in the civil rights movement. We saw that. But I don't have a much better answer for you. I wish I could say, oh, the public trust, once you tell agency people about it, they'll be sure to adopt it. I'm not that naive. Um, so it's a combination of all these factors. Although I do think there will be many people in the agencies that want to take this forward. And in fact, after writing my book, I get, these, um, I get these marvelous letters. I expected 
negativity from agencies, and I've gotten kind of the reverse from people in agencies writing these letters, almost as if they've been liberated because their stories have been affirmed. And they're near retirement usually. <laughs> they say, yes, we've had all this pressure, and now I want to retire and, and figure out how to get this agency um, more responsive to the public good. Yeah? Marissa? Oh. With the uh, undue influence of money and two branches of government, right, we've got at the federal and then also the Congress, um, but now with yesterday's Supreme Court decision um, not putting caps on individual contributions, I feel like now we have the third branch of government also not taking action on campaign finance reform, which really seems kind of like this like linchpin underlying issue for what you're talking about, what James, what Gus Speth writes about. Um, how, how do we bring about campaign finance reform? Okay, that's a great question, campaign financing reform. So there's all the reform efforts that need to be, those are cords to pull as well. Um, it's not my cord, but they're very definite cords to pull. Um, but, but I'll tell you how the campaign financing works with the trust. Um, didn't we all agree I couldn't take the money and, and take a trip to Hawaii with her trust fund? The same principle works um, in any trust. It's called the duty of loyalty. And the duty of loyalty says, and it's one of the, the quintessential principles of a trust relationship or trust empowerment, it says that the trustee cannot act in his or her own self-interest. Well, this was declared by the Supreme Court of the United States um, in, the, in the 1800s in the Gear versus Connecticut case. But the Robinson case I mentioned recently also declares it again. Now, if you take that duty of loyalty and apply it to legislatures and agencies, if they are issuing permits to benefit themselves politically, that is acting um, in their self-interest, thus violating the duty of loyalty. You see it even more directly with legislators because there's a funny coincidence when a legislator gets campaign contributions. Um, they often get very, very interested in the issues that are faced, the regulatory issues that are faced by the person giving them the campaign contribution, and they get laws passed. Well, a duty of loyalty could be implemented by a, a court, um, simply this way, just by setting aside and finding as void any decision that was infected by a violation of the duty of loyalty. In other words, um, it, would, it would say if a legislative body had been um, deciding in its own self-interest, had gotten these campaign contributions and then had decided a matter um, that had bearing on that industry, that could be set aside and there could be a legislative remand, put the decision back to the legislature and clean up the process so that that does not get infected again. And legislative remands are something we don't teach in law school, but they have occurred um, in the past. Judicial courts have remanded to legislatures before, and we think of administrative agency remands all the time, but there are also legislative remands. And so without locking people up in jail, you can simply find as a matter of law, the basis of the decision as infirm. Um, that is how a duty of loyalty would come about in the natural resource context. Would it take care of all the other things the legislatures are being bought off on? No, because um, those aren't trust matters. But as to trust property, legislators sit as fiduciaries. They have a, a, another cap on as fiduciaries. And so they're held to much higher, they should be held to much higher ethical standards. So it doesn't prohibit anybody from donating. It just prohibits a decision from going forward if it were infected by that. That's at least how I have played out the duty of loyalty in my book. And I was delighted to see the duty of loyalty really emphasized in that Robinson opinion by the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I don't want to split hairs, but I was just wondering what you think about the 6% reduction responsibility in light of the common but differentiated responsibilities yeah, no, principle it's not, under Kyoto? It's not splitting hairs at all. Um, it's a great question. The 6% is a planetary standard. Now, how you disperse the responsibility for that standard is another matter. So we know that if 6% is a planetary standard, certainly the industrialized nations have to meet at least that. In my scholarship, I've argued for um, a slightly different approach. 
allocating more liability on the United States and industrialized nations and, and less at the outset on the developing nations. And what this comes down to is really just a timeline. Everybody has to get to zero eventually because the scientists say we have to reach zero carbon emissions and we can't wait a, another few centuries. So everybody has to get to zero eventually. So it's really just the, the steepness of the trajectory of getting there. And courts adjust time frames for equity matters all the time. And I think courts are capable of doing this because we're not having any international response to this common but differentiated responsibility under the, you know, under the major climate treaty. So, so one could argue with the 6% in this country. One could easily say, hey, you should have made it 20% or 15%. The fact is that 6% is a marker that nobody can dispute. Um, unless they dispute the science behind it. But in terms of equity, it's the base marker. And so really, if a court orders that, and then other courts fall in line, because there could be a real domino effect, I think once you get the 6% in, even though it's not enough, it's a great start for the investment that needs to take place to actually um, get us well beyond a 6% within a few years. In other words, it's a matter of jump-starting. It's not perfect, but it's a matter of jump-starting the system. Ultimately, we need to be concerned with the carbon math, making sure it all adds up. And there's a wonderful group um, called EcoEquity and also the Stockholm Institute, and they have partnered. They've taken this 6% trajectory, which is tied to 350 parts per million, and they have um, developed a framework called the Greenhouse Development Rights Framework, and it's on the web and everything. And it, it has trajectories for all the different nations that add up to the 6%. They've done a huge service because a court could just take that and say, well, it's as if an objective party took that UN treaty or the, the climate treaty and determined what would be common but differentiated responsibilities and establish the trajectories for each. So those can be plugged into the legal campaigns, the trust campaigns starting now in other nations. Uh, get great talk. That was that was wonderful. Um, can you talk a little bit about how public trust, um, in in a climate sense, could conflict with private property rights or anything like that? I know. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically about you know physically uh, you know on the shoreline, we have public trust to the ocean, um, but you can use public trust to get a vertical easement and then laterally along the shoreline. Um, I'm also thinking about kind of sustainable development initiatives, you know, Agenda 21, Future Earth, that UN voluntary regulation. Um, or a suggestion, I mean. So that's that's kind of what I'm thinking about here. Yeah, I have kind of a follow-up yeah, well. follow to okay. that. On, so for coastal property and property, so what if you have a coastal property that is, you know, inland, and then as the ocean comes in, it then becomes beachfront, and how do you do private property and public trust with that? Okay, yeah, these are great questions. I love these questions. So the biggest agent of condemnation is not a court, it's nature, and it's coming. Those lands are going to be condemned by nature. Because the seas are rising, the lands are eroding, and um, there's a, a certain dynamic that the amount of sea level rise doesn't really equate to the amount of unusable land because more land erodes at the edge of that sea level rise. And so it's a huge threat to beachfront climate, and ocean sea level rise is a huge threat to beachfront property right now. It's not the legal system that's threatening it, it's beachfront property. So, so the first premise is, Beachfront owners, coastline owners, should be very concerned about climate and should be looking for some way to force governments to take responsibility to reduce carbon emissions, not only for their property but for the habitability of their entire area. So that's the first, first thing. But the second is more of a technical question. When the sea levels rise, okay, so let's take the hand map here. So let's say the water level was this, this. But forget about the incoming tides and tidal fluctuations. Let's say you know, mean tide was here. And with sea level rise, it's here. So this means that this place is going to be inundated. Do we agree on that? With sea level rise. So that's going to be underwater. It's going to be condemned by nature's laws, and it does become the public trust property under just standard legal principles. There have been many, many cases on this um, that I've put in the textbook that Professor Michael Blum and I wrote together. And um, it's the cases all say that, the ones we compiled say that, where the waters fluctuate and rise, 
um, the public trust rises with it. Now that doesn't mean that suddenly the public has fee ownership. Fee is the whole bundle, all you can own. Um, many tide lands, including ones in Washington, are owned um, privately. The, the ones I grew up on are owned privately. They're underwater, but they're, the tide lands are owned privately. And so you can have private ownership with a public trust encumbrance, so to speak, a public trust uh, servitude or encumbrance, easement, burden. <laughs> I'm using all the adjectives I can figure out. And so it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it reverse into state ownership or anything. But it means that the public has an interest in it now because the public has always had an interest in coastlines. They're the major place for defense, defending our nation. They're also important for fishing and commerce so, and recreation. So, so it's always been, in every case I've read, uh, where the water naturally rises and many times where it artificially rises, it, um, it, it creates a public trust encumbrance over those private rights. Now, it's not to say, you know, I said every case I've read, there may be cases out there that say the opposite. So I'm always willing, you know, there's always that caveat, but just under the traditional approach, which is pretty much what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes. What about the idea of the commons and the law of the commons, which I imagine has a long history, both of them? Okay, great question. So the commons, um, the commons is what people associate with the trust. We all think of the air. Do you think of the air as the commons, in a way? OK. And many people think of water and wildlife. It should be the commons. So for, for the normal conversation outside the law, everything I've been talking about is the commons, so to speak. It's those resources that we all have common expectations in. It's, it's the commons, the dialogue that we're used to. But technically speaking, a trust is not under technical legal principles, a trust is not the commons. A commons implies a free-for-all. And so while many people think of this as the commons, a trust implies governmental responsibility. The truth is that there really is no commons in the law, um, except for the, the open oceans, the open seas. But the, everything um, is under a jurisdiction. And so really, you have to um, talk about the trust, about it as, as a trust, to get any obligation on government. Government has power over our waters, our wildlife, everything in the, the natural world. And the atmosphere, too. You know, it issues permits to pollute. So the atmosphere above the jurisdictions are, are part of the trust, so to speak. Now, we may think of it as the commons. There's absolutely no conflict, in my mind, between talking about it as the commons because if you talk about it as the commons, you get a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, I've thought about that. If you talk about it as the public trust, you get some people saying, oh, yeah, I thought about that. But the point is, the legal trust is a concept of property law that imposes obligation on the governments that are already managing those areas, but without the obligation. So the, the commons rhetoric is, I think, very important because it, it it galvanizes people in a way that is important today. People understand the commons. And so I'm never one to, to really um, split hairs and say, no, the trust is something different. It's not. It's just a legal mechanism to enforce protection of what we all think of the commons. Well, thank you very much. We are out of time. I okay. really appreciate it. And, uh, thank you all so much for great questions, too. <laughs>